Y'all know I'm supposed to be getting ready for my move, but I gotta let you know what I thought of Detransition Baby. I've been putting off reading this book for a long ass time. I had a bad feeling in my gut. My instinct was that I would not enjoy it, but everyone said it was amazing and I needed to read it. So after I survived reading Manhunt with all its triggering content, I figured I could survive Detransition Baby as well. I knew it would still be a difficult read for me, so I read it as a buddy read with Amy from BookTube with Amy, and we only read one chapter a day so I wouldn't get overwhelmed by it. Damn, I hated this whole fucking book. I hated it so much. Where do I even begin? Oh, I guess I should tell you what it's about in case you haven't read it. Detransition Baby is about someone who detransitions and then has a baby. <laughs> we have three main characters. The first is the titular detransitioner, Amy or Ames. The book is dual timeline for a while, so we see them living as both a transsexual woman and a detransitioned man. Then there's Reese, a trans woman who was Amy's girlfriend until she detransitioned. And then Katrina, Ames' boss, who he's been sleeping with. He thought that because he'd been on hormone replacement therapy for so long that he would have been sterile. But turns out his swimmers came back and he got Katrina pregnant. Despite living as a man, he is terrified by the prospect of being seen as a father. So he suggests to Katrina that they invite Reese to be a co-parent with them. And that by forging a queer family dynamic, Ames can just be a parent instead of a father. So real quick, let's touch on some of the things that I didn't hate. There were a lot of challenging and triggering conversations throughout the first half of this book, which is what I expected from it. But I was surprised by how much I connected with it. I loved the analogy of queer people as juvenile elephants. With an entire generation of elephants wiped out due to poaching, the younger generation of elephants had no elders to guide them and lashed out. And us queer and trans people, we lost an entire generation to AIDS. So of course the younger generation is lacking guidance and acting out. Then there's the complicated relationship trans women have with sex. How are we supposed to derive pleasure from this visceral, body-focused experience when those same bodies cause us dysphoria? Like, I loved the scene of Amy sobbing into Reese's cock. That just was so real. Then there's the complicated relationship that trans women have with motherhood. Motherhood is so deeply interwoven into society's understanding of womanhood that it feels like if I can't have children, then I'm not really a woman. That's a feeling that a lot of trans women struggle with and something a lot of cis women can relate to in their own ways. There was a nostalgic look back at being the only boy in a dance class and the ways that can be both affirming and painfully dysphoric. Like every year when our recital came around, I dreaded getting our costumes. All I wanted was to have the same uniform as everyone else in my class, but instead I was singled out and forced to wear something else. That shit hurts. There was an excellent conversation about facial feminization surgery. We desire to fix things because we know they can be fixed. Trans women with larger hands don't get obsessed over wanting to get their hands smaller because we don't currently have a way to do such a thing. Like, I never felt dysphoric about my hairline until 2016 when another trans woman told me I had the tranny hairline. And that hurt but I didn't focus too much on it. Then this other trans woman I know, a person who I bitterly resent, because we are both trans Chicago drag queens that have even worn identical looks. Like, here she is wearing my garments. But because she's traditional model size and I'm, well, three times her size, she has always been immensely more popular than me. And thanks to that massive following, a cosmetic surgeon offered her free facial feminization surgery in exchange for promoting their clinic. First thing she got done, her hairline. Since the moment she posted those before and after photos, my hairline has been my greatest dysphoric feature. And while she got to have her surgery for free, I would have to pay 10,000 fucking dollars out of pocket. It's fucking bullshit. From all these difficult subjects, Amy and I were able to have some beautiful conversations. And I was really grateful to her for reading it with me. That was definitely the best part of reading this book. I also loved the moment when they said, I also loved the part where they said, Reese had simply confused failure with being a transsexual. <laughs> I don't quite understand what that means, but it feels right. 
there were a couple of chapters that I really loved, all of which were scenes that just focused on Reese and Katrina. Y'all, I shipped those two so hard. The more we got to see of them together one-on-one, -on -one, I really loved the relationship they were developing. The best iteration of this was the baby registration chapter, which was just so wholesome and cozy and comfortable and happy. Oh, I just, I loved that. But there was also the scene on the fire escape and the scene with Katrina's friends. These chapters were truly a joy to read. I also love the scene where teenage pre-transition Amy goes to her first cross-dresser store and the euphoric experience of getting dolled up for the first time. Oh, that was just so delightful and relatable. Oh, just, I love that. The final thing I loved about this book was this quote. Many people think a trans woman's deepest desire is to live in her true gender. But actually, it's to always stand in good lighting. <laughs> okay, those were the few things I liked about Detransition Baby. Now to get into all of the reasons I hated it. The first time Tori Peters pissed me off was in her chapter set in Chicago. She spent an entire chapter just hating on our beautiful city. Oh, that just got me so mad. I don't know who from Chicago broke her heart, but she must have a grudge or vendetta of some sort against the city. Cause that was bullshit. Then there was Katrina's ignorant ass comment. I don't know much about trans people, but I've seen a couple seasons of Drag Race. Ma'am, those things are not the same. Drag and trans are two completely different things. I get her being ignorant about it, but that is the wrong way to be ignorant. <laughs> Drag and trans are two completely different things. While yes, there is a significant overlap between the two, they are distinct and separate peoples. On top of that, Drag Race and specifically RuPaul, is notorious for discriminating against transgender women. In many of the earlier seasons, if a trans woman got cast on the show, the producers would require them to go off of their hormone medication and present as a male during filming. Then in season nine, Peppermint came out mid-season, and between filming the main season and filming the reunion, had her breasts done. In an interview with RuPaul by The Guardian, they asked him if he would have cast peppermint if she had already had her titties. And RuPaul said, and I quote, probably not. For over a decade, RuPaul went out of her way to not cast transsexual queens on her show because, again, I quote, drag stops being punk when women do it. Um, excuse me. What is more punk than a transsexual woman asserting herself in male-dominated spaces? And like, drag wasn't even a male-dominated space before RuPaul. As I've told y'all countless times, trans women have always been a part of drag. It was RuPaul on his TV show that told people otherwise. So saying, I don't know trans people, but I've seen Drag Race is just too much not the right response. Oh, and then that bitch Amy goes on a rant against Candy Darling. Excuse you. That woman is an icon. She is like the trans Marilyn Monroe. Candy Darling was a trans celebrity from the late 60s, early 70s, best known for her work with Andy Warhol and The Factory. She died in 1974. Like, here's one of her most iconic photos taken on her deathbed as she was dying from lymphoma. Candy Darling is beautiful, and to shit on her legacy like that is just unacceptable. Okay, so now the rest of my complaints are all in spoiler territory, so I'm gonna give you a timestamp here and in the description if you want to skip the spoilery parts. Spoilers in five, four, three, two, one. First of all, I was really confused by Amy's reaction to Reese cheating. It was a very monogamous kind of response, which I'm not saying trans women can't be monogamous, just most of the ones that I know aren't. And if she's so comfortable to invite Reese to co-parent with her and Katrina, I don't know, the, the two situations seemed incongruous with each other. I understand that a poly or open relationship is completely different than cheating. 
With the former, there is the expectation of communication. You've discussed what your boundaries are and your acceptable practices. Cheating is built on deception. But like, it's one thing to be upset by cheating, and it's another to blow it up to the level that Amy did. To be so angry and jealous that you spent every day monitoring her GPS location just to see if she's still stepping out or not? I can't see someone with that level of jealousy and possessiveness then being comfortable with, let me share my girlfriend and child with another person. I just don't get that. Before reading, I was nervous about this book because of the subject of detransitioning. I know that the majority of detransitioners do so because of societal pressures makes living as trans just too difficult for them. So even though they go back to living or presenting as cis, they're still trans on the inside. I was so nervous though because a lot of bigots like to point to detransitioning as an argument against trans people and transitioning, but in doing so being willfully ignorant of the underlying cause. I was worried that Detransition Baby would give these people more ammo, fueling the fire of their hatred. So that was my mindset going into this. Then we meet William, a detransitioned transsexual now living as a man. Reading his story, I felt so bad for him because this was a clear case of him still being a trans woman, but just not being able to handle living like that. His story was a really emotional one, but it rang true to what I know about the subject of detransitioning, which made me optimistic about the rest of the book. Then, after Amy's altercation with Stanley, she detransitions. But it isn't because of the violence she experienced. No, the violence was just the conduit for her real reason, dysphoria. Amy shat on the entire trans community when she detransitioned. She decided that because her nose got broken, and was now crooked, and that she spoke a couple of times in a lower register, that she was really a man all along. There are many trans women with crooked noses and deep voices, and they're still motherfucking trannies, bitch. So you got hot-headed and lashed out at a dude for being a prick. Of course you did. Having that rage doesn't make you a man. But no, because she responded reasonably to a painful situation, she has to abandon her truth. And for what? To go back to feeling numb? Ugh, fuck her. It would have been one thing if the reason for his detransition was as it was stated in the beginning, that he just didn't have the strength to keep exposing himself to that kind of violence and pain. Yeah, that's something that many people actually experience, and I could get behind that. But no, he said that dressing up was silly because of a broken nose and a deep voice. This implies to me that, at least according to Ames's worldview, that if a trans woman has clockable traits, there's no point in her even trying to live as a woman. Being clockable doesn't make a trans woman any less of a woman. Oh, I was just so offended by this. Like, I have fought so hard to live my truth as a woman. Yeah, my voice might be generally lower, but that doesn't mean I'm going to give up everything I've worked for. Oh, this just ruined the entire book for me. Ames isn't the only asshole, however, because when Katrina finds out that the married man Reese has been fucking is HIV positive, even though his viral load is undetectable, and when you're undetectable, the virus is untransmittable, Katrina freaks the fuck out and goes full on AIDS panic. She accuses Reese of putting their baby's life in jeopardy and threatens to abort the child. What the fuck? However, while I am immediately tempted to start hating on her, I am inclined to also show her grace. As was established during the coming out scene, Katrina is still very new to the whole being queer thing. All of us queers start out not knowing everything and bring some false and problematic presumptions into it until we learn otherwise. And this isn't me being a hypocrite or a double standard. Don't want to hear none of that. Katrina was just learning to be queer. She didn't know better yet. Ames had lived as a queer trans woman for what? eight years, he knew the message he was sending to other trans women when making the stance that being clockable means you're a man. Ames is the real villain of this story. 
I really hated the way Detransition Baby ended. I was under the impression going into this book that we would actually get to see them raising this child together. But instead, it ends with their family unit breaking apart only 12 weeks after conception and the fucking abortion. Don't get me wrong, I love an abortion, but in this context, it just pissed me off even more. They got us so invested into their family, and now it's over before it could even begin. Damn, I hated that. I hate how popular this book is. I hate that it's one of the best-selling trans novels ever, because now a lot of people with minimal exposure to trans lives will think that this is an accurate representation. Even with Manhunt being as challenging and triggering and painful as it was, because everything in that book was real. It may have been exaggerated or hyperbolized, but the characters' behaviors and the way trans people were treated was 100% genuine. Detransition Baby just doesn't ring true. And it upsets me that of all the magnificent books by trans authors that are out there, that this is the one that has taken off so successfully. All that said, I'm not giving up on Tori Peters as a writer. I'm still really eager to read Infect Your Friend and loved ones, and will buy it as soon as it becomes available again. Detransition Baby was just not the book for me. I should have trusted my gut and stayed away. But at least now I know to listen to that instinct next time I feel it. Have y'all read any of her other work? What'd you think of it? Do you have any recommendations for less shitty trans books for me to read? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and if you know a trans book I would hate, let me know that too so I can make sure to never read it. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if it pleases and sparkles, I'll see you in the next video. Mwah!